temperature coefficient, which is also some of the things that you're supposed to know, but not too much on this. You okay. need to know what temperature coefficient is. And then, uh, let me just check, nobody, yeah. Calculations on how to calculate the resistance of a material once you start heating it up. If you recall last time when I was teaching about uh, temperature direct proportion with a current or resistance depending on the re current and the resistance also depending on the heat. So this is that part now. You know, we have got different materials. When you heat them, some of them are also increasing in resistance. Others, they reduce in the resistance. So what you need to come up with here is just to understand what happens to the material when you are heating it up. For temperature coefficient material, that's what we call them. There's positive temperature coefficient, and there are those that are called negative temperature coefficient uh, materials. So the positive uh, temperature coefficient materials are those when you heat them up, they increase in resistance. So in the theory, they can ask to say the temperature coefficient of a material for positive temperature coefficient, what is it? Then you have to explain. So for pure metals like copper, lead, aluminum, you know, all these are positive temperature coefficient. Why they have a positive temperature coefficient? Because when you start heating them up from a certain temperature, to a higher temperature. When you compare the resistances before and after, the one initially is going to be low because it was very cold. And when you start heating it up, the temperature is going to increase. As the temperature is increasing, the resistance also is also increasing proportionally to the increase in temperature. Yes, Mr. Fury, um, on what page is this in the book? Because I like to mark things as we go along. It's page 11 of 82, yeah, page 11. Uh, my page is on mark one, two, three, or whatever, you know. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you might it. be using another book. You know, I'm using a second book. Are you in the second book? Yes, auto, the one that All says right. AutoCAD. I think it's CAD book, electrical CAD. Yeah, mm. okay, no, I will find it now. You must use that one because that's the, the one examiner is using mostly. Okay, I'm there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will be using this one so much. The second one. So page 11. I forgot about the second book, actually. I'm digging around, digging around in the first book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's fine to work with both of them, but I'm saying usually the examiner is using with, is working with this one more especially yeah. than the other one. Okay. Okay. So it's page 11. Uh, yes, I've got it. Okay. So what we are saying is maybe they might ask you to give examples of uh, metals that have got a, po a positive temperature coefficient which means that they increase in resistance when we increase their temperatures. Then there are other metals which like plastics and all that, when you start heating them up, the resistance is going to reduce. Those are negative temperature or they have a negative temperature coefficient. They are totally different from positive uh, temperature coefficient, which are pure metals. So if they ask you to give examples of um, the negative temperature coefficient materials, you must always remember that it's those uh, like plastics mostly. They have a negative temperature coefficient. This means that if there is a rise in temperature, there is a decrease in resistance and the current will also increase. Yes, because once resistance has reduced, we know that current will increase. It's the opposite. Okay. And then there is an equation that you're supposed to know, which is this one. Like in this subject, they don't give you a formula sheet. So what you need to know is that uh, these formulas like Ohm's law, uh, power, energy, and this one, you must know them by heart. Also resistivity formula, you must know it by heart. Examiner doesn't give a formula sheet. So in cases asking about a certain cube of material, maybe copper, started heating from 20 degrees to 120 degrees. At 20 degrees, maybe the resistance was 6 ohms. What would be its resistance at the final temperature? So obviously, because it's copper, as you are increasing the temperature, you expect the resistance to increase. But how do you prove that? You have to place all the known values here. Let's say I give you the initial resistance. The first part you see here is the final resistance, RF. This RO means resistance, original resistance, or the initial resistance. That is that one, okay? And then we do have one, this number is a standard number. 
it doesn't change then plus alpha this sign is called alpha and this is the temperature coefficient of that specific material because we are saying that different materials are made differently they have got different number of atoms and different number of electrons so we expect them to have a different temperature coefficient so there is also a scientific table that indicates their temperature coefficient of material resistivity conductivity you know all those uh, properties of metals you will find them on certain tables so this sign here yes. is a sign for temperature coefficient of that material that you're talking about then the delta t which is the change in temperature in science we call this delta as a change in temperature meaning that from final to your initial to final what was the change like my example i said it was at 20 degrees then we hit this material to 120 so the change is 100 you know 120 minus minus 20 which was the initial temperature so they might ask you for anything here, maybe provided with final uh, resistance, given initial resistance, then they're asking you for T2, final temperature. It's a matter of knowing how to manipulate the equation. They won't always ask you for the final resistance, no. You have to know how to make T the subject of the formula, or how to make this temperature coefficient the subject of the formula. It's a, mat a matter of just, you know, uh, manipulating or playing around with the equation. Do we know how to do that? Hmm? Sorry, I just went quietly for a second. Say again. I was saying, do you know how to manipulate an equation? Let's say from this equation, I'm asking for hmm? T, T2. Hmm? How can you make T2 the subject of the formula? Remember delta T, this triangle T. Yes. means that is TF, which is final temperature, minus TO, which is original temperature, or the initial temperature. Okay. So if ever you have been given the initial temperature, and they don't give you the final temperature, but they give you the resistance at the final temperature, which is this one here. If they give you this one, and I give you the initial resistance before heating up, then um, I give you the temperature coefficient, and I give you T1, which is initial temperature. Then I'm asking for T2, because delta T is T2 minus T1. How would you go about getting T2 to be the subject of the formula? Because they might ask you for T2 given everything here. I hope you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what you're going to do, you know RO. RO must come out of the right-hand side. You must okay. take it to the left, and how do we get RO to the left? It's by dividing it on the left-hand side. Yes. So it will be RT minus RO equals to 1 plus alpha. Then in brackets, we are going to have T2 minus T1. Clear. That is for okay. delta T. You replace delta T with T2 minus T1. Okay. Okay, the next step is to take this one to the other side of the equal sign, where there is R, RF over RO. This one is positive, so when it jumps the equal sign, it becomes minus. Minus, yes. Yes, so it's going to be RF divided by RO, minus 1 equals to alpha t or then open brackets t2 minus t1 clear okay yeah we are taking them to the left what do we want here we are looking for t2 only we only want t2 here that's what i'm saying so now yes. you have got alpha then open brackets t2 minus t1 the next once you take t1 uh, number one here you take alpha to the left. How do you take this sign to the left? It's divide to the left. So there are two things that will divide on the left. It's going to be RO and alpha. Then you are, at the end, you are going to remain with T2 minus T1. Okay. Yeah, so T2 minus T1. So to remain with T2 only, I'll take minus T1 to the left, which will become plus T1. Clear. 
Okay. That's how it will be. It will become plus T1 when it goes to the left. So we'll see. I'll try to share the board and just show you how it works. But that is how you manipulate the equation. Or else I can just try to manipulate and send it on, um, on WhatsApp. You will be able to see how it works. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Yes, good, good. All right, so that is this part. And we need to continue. What's, is my computer frozen? What? Let's see. Okay. It's still on the same page. Yeah, there we go down. Okay, I'm yes. scrolling down now. All right, so if you have no questions here, just know that we are going to, it's a homework. I'm going to do this with you next week together with those calculations on series and parallel. Okay. But I've already posted some videos from last term, which you can also have a look at, calculating series and parallel resistors. You'll see. I've done on the board and just have a look. Go down and scroll, scroll everywhere in Google Classroom. You'll find the videos there. Okay, that, that is, say again, the calculation is? Mm -hmm. That is the calculations here. Then I'm starting this other part. There isn't too much calculations now. We, where we talk of inductance. Okay. Okay, I so think, we, uh, have, we have been talking about resistance, and resistance is the, you know, ability of a resistor to regulate the flow of current. Ability of a resistor to regulate current flow, that is its resistance. When we come to inductance, it is ability of an inductor to store magnetic field. An inductor is called a coil or a loop. You know, you've seen wires that are coiled on any electric circuit. Mm -hmm. When you see a wire that has got like a coil, that is not a resistor. That one is an inductor. Any wire you see in any electric circuit looking like a coil, you see like bending like that, it is an inductor. And the purpose of an inductor on any electric circuit diagram is to store magnetic field or to help in the production of magnetic field. Okay. You say that is the, the, the production of an electric field. Mag yeah, magnetic field, not electric. Magnetic, from magnet. You know, magnetic field. Yes. Mm. So, any time you find, you know why I'm saying this, you think of a generator and a motor. Generator and motors, do you see that there's copper wires inside? Yes. Why? You can heat resistant and obviously um, it won't help anything, I think. They know, help in okay. production of magnetic field. You learn uh, next time now how magnetic field is important. Magnetic field is important because it helps in the production of electricity. Without magnetic field, you can't have current, you can't have production of electricity. So the purpose of those copper wires that you see in any motor or any generators, you know, they are winded wires, copper wires winded around. There are also inductors in other ways. They are there for a purpose, to produce magnetic field or to help in the production of magnetic field. So when I ask you to explain what inductance is, it is just the ability of an inductor to produce magnetic field or the measure of magnetic field in an inductor is called inductance. It is measured in Henry, that is the unit. Inductance of a coil is measured in Henry. The same way resistance is measured in ohms, and, the, and resistance is when we are talking about a resistor. Inductancy is when we are talking about an inductor which is a copper okay. coil. Okay, and the units are very important. SI unit for inductancy is Henry, or capital H. And when you are calculating inductance, we use L. You will see it, this one. Can you see the L here, capital L? Yes, I can see that it. That is inductance, and it's measured in Henry. Then they are saying because of the resistance in the coil, there will be inductive resistance or reactance. What we try to say here is that when you have a coil on any electric circuit and current is flowing through the coil, it is offering resistance as well. Do you agree? 
Yes. When current is going through any wire, whether it's a coil or a straight wire, there's resistance. So what they are saying here is the resistance in that coil is called inductive reactance. If you are to measure how much resistance is being offered by that coil or by the inductor, they call that resistance inductive reactance. And it's XL like that, in inductive reactance. It's measured in ohms. Can you see? Yes. It's Isn't that an XL? Yeah, it's not I. It's an L. It's supposed to be XL. It's an L. Yeah, it's more L. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, XL. Then the formula for that uh, resistance or inductive reactance is 2 times pi times frequency times inductance. This also you must know by heart. All right, just give me a second. I'm just writing that down. Yes. Frequency and hello, okay? XL equals to 2 times pi times F for frequency times L for inductance. All right. Yes, making sure that inductance is always in Henry. And it's always in Henry. A Henry, yeah. Sometimes they might give you in milli Henry. You remember resistivity. Sometimes they gave us micro Henry or miri Henry. You have to convert milli Henry back into Henry or micro Henry, Henry into Henry. How do you change milli Henry to Henry? I think you divide it by two. I said how do you milli to micro uh, to just milli milli Henry to Henry. You divide time, by time for, you times you, divide it. you can divide by one thousand or times ten to the power negative three. Okay, you can either divide whenever you hear of milli. You divide it with a thousand, and then the answer you get is Henry. Okay. When it's micro, you divide by one million. The answer you get is Henry. Yes. As long as there's a micro symbol in front of this H, don't use that number in the equation because it's wrong. You have to change it back into Henry by dividing it with a, a thousand squared or one million. Clear? Yes. Okay. We are talking about an inductor here. We are done with resistance. So now, this inductor has got properties and you know those things you must know briefly about. So the things we have talked about is the resistance in the inductor is inductive reactance. And what's the formula? There is the formula. In practice, there are no pure inductors. You must listen to this question. In, in practice, there are no pure inductors because of the resistance. So you cannot have the pure inductance because of the resistance that it offers. The current all the time is going to lag the voltage by 90 degrees in pure inductive circuits. What does this mean? When I spoke of a resistor last time or last week, I said resistance is inversely proportioned to current, but current and voltage remains proportioned. Do you remember by Ohm's law? When we're talking of Ohm's law, current and voltage are directly proportioned to each other. As long as the temperature and the pressure is constant, when current is flowing through the wire, voltage, when increases, current will also increase in a resistance or resistive circuits. When we come to right. inductance or inductive circuits, it's the, it doesn't move like that. Current and voltage are not proportioned. When one increases, one is behind the other, meaning they are not in proportion. They don't move together. They differ by 90 degrees angle. That's what they mean here. When voltage is at 90, current is, that's why they're saying current lags voltage. Current is behind voltage. Can you see the word lagging? Yes. When voltage is at 90 degrees, current will be behind at zero. You know, yes. if it's going anticlockwise like that. That is what we mean in pure inductive circuits. Those sketches are very important. So when you go to the other book, they have got some nice sketches uh, on inductance that you will see yourself, that current and voltage are not in the same line. They differ by 90 degrees. That is in all inductive circuits. As long you know this electric circuit, there is inductors. 
there is, there is no way current and voltage will remain proportion. They differ by 90 degrees. Clear? Yes. Okay. When we come to capacitance, and before I go here, do you know the ways in which we can increase the production of magnetic field? I know examiner might ask you, name the three things by which you can increase the production of magnetic field in an inductor. Meaning that in which ways can we increase indu inductance? The way I was asking last time, in which ways can we increase resistance? We told, or you told me, or you know that ca resistance can be increased by increasing the length of the wire, by increasing the diameter of the wire, by increasing the temperature. You know those three. Yes. Yes. But now when we come to inductance, which are the three ways do you think can help you increase inductance or can help an inductor to produce magnetic field? What do you think? Maybe, maybe you can add less coils. Hmm? I'm not sure. Um, or extend the wire. Extending, yeah, incre right? increasing the number of coils. You are very right. Okay. When you increase the number of coils, you are increasing magnetic field. That's why a coil, once the coil is not, you know, long, there will be magnetic field but less, le less strength. And all then right. all the time think of the wires in a motor or wires in a generator. Why are there so many bands of wires, copper wires there? It's to enhance the production of magnetic field. All right, now it makes sense to me. Yes. The next part is increasing the current flow. Whenever there is current flow, there is high magnetic field produced. There is what we call Lenz's law. I don't know in life if you've heard about Lenz and Faraday's law. I heard about Faraday's, but not Lenz. Lenz. Lenz and Faraday, they're almost the same what they speak about. Faraday is a guy who was there, you know, when they were inventing magnetic fields and current and all that. So Faraday said that any wire that has got current in it produces magnetic field. Any wire that has got current in it produces magnetic field. So I think by today you'll be able to get there. So how do we believe that? I think I even showed you the first time the effect of current on magnetic field. You remember when we did the coils and... You know, current flow into the wire and the coils were deflecting. Yes, I have to go back on that. That is now. that one in chapter one. It tells us that any wire that has got current produces magnetic field, which means that the more the current, the more the magnetic field. So if yes. you increase the current flow in the wire, what you're increasing as well is the magnetic production, magnetic field production. Then apart from that, they say that you can also increase the magnetic field production by using what we call an iron core. You will see as I'm moving on, I'll show you what is the iron core. It's a okay. ferromagnetic material. An iron core is, is a material that gets mag magnetized once there's current flow around it. When there's no current flow around it, it's not a magnet. But it becomes magnetized once there's current flow in it or around it. It is an iron core. C-O-R-E. Okay. All right, okay. Iron is I-R-O-N. You will see it. So those are the three things you must remember to mention. Three ways in which we can increase inductance. Increasing the number of coils, increasing uh, current flow, and also using an iron core. Okay. Yeah. Then we come to another part of, you know, electricity, which talks about a capacitor. You know, these are electronic circuit uh, symbols that you are supposed to know by next week so that you start drawing. Once uh, you know a resistor, you know inductor, you know capacitor, and diodes and transistors, there are only a few things we teach you in this syllabus. Then all those will be put on an electronic drawing, and then we can create a drawing called electronic circuit diagram. It shows only electronics, you know, these components. Okay. Yeah. So when I come to capacitance, obviously you know we are talking about a capacitor. And the purpose of a capacitor on any electric circuit diagram is to produce or to help in storing uh, electric current or electric charge. 
if you go and buy a capacitor, even if it's looking very small in your eyes, it can be very dangerous because what it determines the strength of that capacitor is the amount of charges that it is storing inside it. And those charges are electrons, which are negatively charged electrons that are producing current. But because they have nowhere to go, so we are just, it's like a drum. You're keeping things in a drum. It's a storage for electrons. That is a capacitor. You can move with a capacitor to another country as long as you're not touching it with your naked hands. You can go and then when you reach there, connect any wire and to any load, it's going to switch on. You can connect to a light bulb as long as it's not too much charges because if it's too much charges, it has got high current and it can blow the bulb. So it depends with how much current it contains, how much charges it contains, that determines its capacitance. And we are saying that capacitance now is the measure, okay? It's the measure of which the capacitor stores electrons or the ability of a capacitor to store electrons or to store electric charges. So if a capacitor has got higher capacitance, it means to you that it has got more electrons. It's, got, it's, got, it's able to store a lot of electrons. And that is not like by looking that it's big or small. Some of them are small, but they are compact. Inside there, there's a lot of charges. There's a lot of electrons. That means it's highly charged. Okay. okay. And yes. uh, you know examples where you can find capacitors. Tell me where you can find capacitors. Probably in your DB board in your house. Okay, in a car battery, straight away. You know a car battery, why they say oh, it's ah, drained, yeah. we need to charge it, we need to do what? Yeah. When they take a car battery out and they go and recharge or to start charging it, you are going to make sure that on those plates that are inside, they are plates, I don't know if you've seen inside a car battery. Yes, sir. They are metal plates, right? Parallel, standing, you know, parallel yes. to each other. But yes. those metal plates, do they contact each other or there's a space in between? There's a space in between. Yes, them. why they do that? I don't know, to conduct enough electricity to go between the next one and the They prevent, one. Uh, you know, aching. Because if those metal plates are touching each other, they are going to produce, you know, some eggs here, you know. They start aching and they can cause explosion. So why they don't touch each other is because they are highly energized. You know, on those faces of the capacitors, we call them capacitors. Those plates are called capacitors inside. So it's a capacitor next is a capacitor, capacitor next to each other. But in between the metal plates, there's a space left there to prevent touching of the plates. Okay? Yes. But electrons are jumping from one plate to another when you are charging your car battery because there's positive side of the battery to the negative side so as current is flowing it's going to make a complete uh, path from positive to negative positive to negative but how are the electrons jumping or going across the plates they get attracted because the plates are positively charged material those are metals and then uh, electrons are negatively charged. So electrons are attracted to the faces or to the plates of the capacitor. And then as you are charging, until such time that the battery's voltage is the same voltage with the supply, then you know that it's fully charged. Other than that, you, co you continue charging the battery. If you measure across the terminals of the battery and the voltage is 200 volts or 12 volts, then you know the supply is 12, then it's fully charged. But if it's still 8 volts and the supply is 12 volts, it's still not yet fully charged. Until it gets to the same voltage as the supply, then they say that, okay, now this capacitor is fully charged. Because when we measure across the EMF or the voltage across the terminals is the same voltage we are getting from the supply. Then they can remove the, the current or the power supply from the battery. And that is when we say it is fully charged. That battery can stay fully charged as long as there's no external wires attached to the battery. But if you connect your wires, which is now your conductors, and to the load or to anywhere in your car, it means now you are using that power in from the, cap uh, from the battery. You are sending, you know, you need power in the car for, you know, for the engine power, for whatever. You take power from the battery or for or the radio or anything. 
So once you start using that, and as long as it's not recharging, you will drain it again. You will drain yes. it. So it must be recharged again. So the capacitance is all about how much current is stored in a capacitor. And it is measured in farads. There. Capital F. And they are saying, right. because of the resistance in a capacitor, a capacitor also offers resistance. Because of the resistance in the capacitor, there will be capacitive reactance. That is the resistance in the capacitor. It is called XC, with a small letter C, for capacitance. Okay. Capacitance is capital C, and it's measured in farads. Frequency is measured in hertz. I think you know, H-E-R-T-Z. Yes, you, got, you get that in radius as well. They tell you, you know, so many mm. hertz to get to that signal. When we talk of frequency of a wave, it's just like talking about how many complete cycles are being formed in a unit time. You know, when current is flowing, especially alternating current. When alternating current is flowing, it alternates, you know, to the positive, to the negative, up and down, up and down, it alternates. So as it is alternating, it's making a wave, which we call a sine wave. But now if you want to know how many waves are being formed in a unit period of time, you are looking for its frequency. Yes. Like in South Africa, the frequency is how many? How much? 50, eh? 50 hertz. So, yes. It I is 50 yeah, hertz. 35 and 50 or something like that. No, yes. 50 hertz. If you check through or behind any, any appliance you know, as long as it's from South Africa, go behind computers, your laptop, TVs, anything, you will see the frequency at the back is 50 hertz. What they mean by 50 hertz is the, the sine wave, or we can say the alternating current in South Africa moves at a speed of, you know, it makes 50 cycles in a second or in a unit period of time. 50 cycles. That's why we are not able to see the blink of a light, you know, blinking. When current is flowing, you just look at a light like it's one single light. But there is alternating current taking place. But you will never see the light dimming and switching on and off because of low frequency. Why? Because AC current is moving very fast. And to make 50 cycles in a second, sometimes it's less than a second, 0 0.02 seconds when we calculate. It gives us that 50 hertz is formed in 0 0.02 seconds. Just imagine. So it moves very fast. All right, so that is the frequency of a wave, and that is the formula for capacitive reactance. When you're looking for the resistance in a capacitor, there is the formula, one over two pi FC. This is a, um, a fraction. The other one was just a straightforward. You saw here, it was just yeah. straightforward, yes. yes. That's the, but it's also ohms, it's also ohms. And coulomb, let's see, coulomb, what, uh -huh. what exactly? The coulombs is the charges, we are not talking about coulomb, this is capacitance, there is the C. Yes, but that, that calculation you show me now, XC and 1 over 2 times pi times Yeah, times you are looking for capacitive C? reactance, it's this one. Okay, so that's what it stands for. Yes, which is the resistance in a capacitor. Okay. When I talk of coulombs, coulombs is now the charges, electrons in a, in a, in a capacitor is also measured in coulombs. We're talking about charges. So if we want to measure the charges only, we are talking about see, the coulombs. Okay. Like they say that the coulombs is how many electrons are flowing in a unit period of time. You are counting the number of electrons per unit time. That is your coulombs passing or the charges. But when we come to capacitance, it's a measure of the storage in a capacitor, how much it stores those coulombs or the charges. Okay. Okay. All right, let's quickly go through magnetic field because I wanted us to push and finish the theory. Magnetic field, you need to have time to read through. I've mentioned that magnetic field or magnet is very important in electric uh, or yes. electrical studies because it helps in the production of what we call magnetic field. And then magnetic field, in reality, they move from north to south. You need to read about, you know, properties of magnetic field. If you know a magnet... Yes. Oh, let me charge my laptop. What's going on? I'm coming. Okay. Okay, we are fine. <laughs> 
All right, so we are saying magnetic fields, they move from north, north to south. When you hold your compass and you hold a magnet, it's uh, the north side of the uh, magnet will, will point to the north pole. That's why they say the north side, north pole. And then the lines of magnet from that magnet will be moving from north to south, but inside the magnet, they will move from south to north. They make a closed loop. If you read through here, they are giving you the properties of magnetic field that the direction of a line of magnetic flux is always pointing towards the north seeking pole. Okay. Then each line of a magnetic flux always forms a closed loop or path. How does it form a closed path? Like I've told you that inside it moves from south to north, outside it comes out from north to south, so it's back and forth. There's no way it's going to break up. It's a continuous flow of magnetic lines. So it's outside is north to south, inside is south to north, just like that. Okay, that is another property. Then uh, each line of magnetic flux always forms a closed path, which we know. Magnetic flux lines never intersect. They are always parallel to each other. They will never cross each other. The lines of magnets are always parallel to each other. That mm -hmm. is what it means. Then we may compare the lines of magnetic flux with that of an elastic. It's always trying to shorten itself. You know, if you, uh, you take elastic band, you try to uh, stretch it, and once you let go, it goes back. So that's what they say, that lines of magnets are like elastic band. As long as there is magnetic field or there is a magnet, it will always be around it. But if you remove the magnet, it's going to collapse. So it can expand or collapse like an elastic band. Then yes. parallel lines of magnetic flux in the same direction will repel each other. You know what it means by repel. They don't attract. Yes, they push each other away. Uh, yes, so as long as they are they parallel, use. they always push each other away, which means they will never cross. It, that yes. one agrees with the first point, the or second point. You know, they never intersect, so they will always go parallel because they always repel each other. Yeah. Yes. Then when we talk about uh, this concept here, you must always remember a corkscrew. You know a corkscrew, the one you open, the wine opener. What do you call it? This one. Um, isn't it? Um, yeah, when you're opening uh, wine, what do we use that thing? Yes. It's a corkscrew. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. You. OK, so. You know, we relate to a corkscrew as the direction of what you can see, current flow around. They are saying current flow is into the wine or away. So when you're opening, the corkscrew is either moving around, which is your magnetic field. So assume that the direction of a corkscrew is the direction of the current that, uh, magnetic field that is produced by the current that is flowing inside the wire or outside the wire. So when a corkscrew is going inside the bottle, wine bottle, it means that current is going into the wire. When you start unscrewing it, it starts coming out. It means current is coming out, but the direction of magnetic field will always be around the wire that is carrying current. That is the concept. Clear? Great. I remember seeing this when we had classes in this in school about it. <laughs> that was like uh, 30 years ago for me. <laughs> yeah, so that is what they're trying to relate here. So that you don't forget. Just remember about opening wine and then direction of current flow is this arrow. It's either into the wire or outside the wire. And the direction of current flow in or out depends on the direction, whether clockwise or anticlockwise. You see, when you're rotating this cock, when you're rotating clockwise, current is in. When you start unscrewing it, current is out. So there is a relationship between the direction of current flow and the direction of magnetic field that will be produced. And that is what they are mm -hmm. saying here. The direction of current flow in this conductor may be determined by placing a wood screw next to the conductor. When the screw is turning in the clockwise direction, it will move away from you and compare to that of the current flow in the same direction. And then there are two sketches that we usually re use. When current is into the wire, when current is going into the wire, that is the symbol. There's a force that is always, you know, imparted on the wire. 
which is always mm -hmm. downwards. So yeah. just remember that when current is going into the wire, I usually use the concept of a motor. You know, in case you're asking where you're going to use this, this is called a motor theorem. Why we call this a motor theorem? You know, for the motor to rotate, it needs current. Do you know that? Yes. Current needs, uh, the motor needs current. So when I say current into the motor, it's current in the wire. So whenever current enters into the wire or into the motor, there's always a force that is going to push the shaft of the motor down. This is the force on the motor down because the motor has got a rotor. That rotor will be pushed down and where the magnetic lines will be moving from north to south. They will always move from north to south. But when current comes out of the motor, current is always in and out, in and out, continuously, as long as the voltage is on or the power is on. There's always current in and out, in and out. So relate this to the movement of a motor. Motor is always rotating down and up, down, up, down, up. So when the motor is pushed down, it is at that point when current is entering the motor. When current comes out of the motor, the force is pushed up. You see, that's why we call this motor theorem. Okay. Yes. I've got it now. And then on motor that motor theorem. Yes. Is it, is it motor theory or motor theorem? Yeah, theory. Motor theory or okay. theorem. Theorem. All right. Yes. Motor theorem with a M. Okay. Yes. All right. So once you understand this concept. There is what we call Fleming's left-hand rule, which also comes back to what we are saying, current in and out with the force. What is Fleming's left-hand rule? They're saying when the thumb, which is your left-hand side, eh? your thumb on your left-hand side, and the index finger and the middle finger, there are three of them. When you hold them at 90 degrees or right angled to each other, the index finger is always going to present or to point in the direction of magnetic field. Then the middle finger will always show the direction of current flow. And the thumb will show the direction of movement, which is force. So we need to hold these three at 90 degrees to each other. So when current is in, make sure that your middle finger is pointing away from you and the force will go down. You see the thumb goes down. When the, the middle finger points away from you, the thumb will go down. Yes. Then when current comes out of the wire, then the middle finger points towards you, but you see the force goes up, which is your thumb. On your left. So it's down and up, down and up. So just try to play around with current direction. Your current direction is the middle finger. So if it's away, it shouldn't point to you. It should point, or if it's into the wire, it should point away from you you see the thumb will be pointing down. When they say current yes. is out of the conductor, the, the, then the middle finger will point towards you, and then the uh, thumb is going to go up. Have you tried to, to practice this? <laughs> I'm doing it now. <laughs> yeah. Hold the, three, uh, the thumb, index finger, and the middle finger at 90 degrees to each other. Okay. Yeah. When you go to the other book, you see they have, uh, they have demonstrated what I'm explaining, né? the other electrical book. You have time and go through that book. Okay. Yeah, I'm not I'll sure if I have it here. Let's see. Where is that one? Documents. Yeah, because when I'm here, I show the students nicely what I'm talking about. But here, unless you see the book, uh, electronic textbook. This one, electrical. There is two books. This one with N five. I want to get to that part quickly. Yes, I've got the solenoids, the conductors, everything there. Uh, are you on the solenoids? No, I'm just paging through it right now. Mm. You know, just to but I'll get there. I'll show you just now about it there. Ah, yes, I saw that. I'm, I'm right at now, yes. This is Fleming's, but this is right hand, eh? This is for generator. I'll come to generator theorem. But the same way, but use the left hand side for Fleming's left hand rule. This yeah. is Fleming's right hand rule. 
It's different from Fleming's right, uh, left. Left is a motor theorem. Right hand rule is a generator theorem. So what I was saying on a, a, a motor theorem is that this here, the middle finger is current flow. When it's into the wire, it must be like this, away from you. When it's out of the wire, then it must point to, you see the thumb will change. It's in and out, in and out. But the magnetic field will always be the middle, this uh, index finger. This will be magnetic field. This is our force on the motor. This one here is the current flow in and out. Clear? Yes. Okay. At least you've seen the sketch. So back to that. Fleming's, you need to be able to state. Ne? In theory, they'll ask you state Fleming's uh, left-hand rule. And then there's a formula that you need to learn. This formula talks about that force that is on the motor shaft, which is the force that's going to push the motor up and down, up and down. How do you get the amount of force on the motor? You use the density. This B is the density, the flux density. It's amount of uh, magnetic flux times the length of the wire, which is times the length in which the wire, uh, current is flowing in that wire, times current flow. So one, two, three will determine the force on the motor or on the rotor of the motor. So it's the density which is measured in Weber per square meters or Tesla. This T is T-E-S-L-A, T-E-S-L-A, Tesla. All right. It's the measure of density. Then the force is in newtons, current flow, amps, the length in meters. So it means that if you want to increase the force on the shaft, increase the density, increase the magnetic field, increase the length, increase the current. So they might ask you, list the three things that determines the force on the conductor when current is flowing in a conductor. These are the three things, density, length, current. Okay. All right. And this is the activity. You will try to go through this in your own spare time. They are trying to ask you to solve for force. One, two, three questions. You need to use this same equation here. Force times length. Let's just read the first one. A current carrying conductor is placed at 90 degrees, which is right angled in a magnetic field, having a density of 0 0.6 Tesla. A current of 350 amps is passing through it. Calculate the force on this conductor per meter length. So it's per one meter. So the length is one meter. Then go and replace in the formula. They only want the force. You have the density, you have the current, you have the length. You can get your, your force in newtons. Okay. Okay. Then uh, you need to read through the solenoids. I think these are the two pages left now. Let me just finalize. What we mean by a solenoid and the relay, we talk about, um, I don't know in that book, yeah, it's this one. When you have an iron core, this is an iron core winded with copper wire. You can see the copper wire around the iron core. Then we call this one a solenoid. A solenoid is when you have an iron core and wind it with copper wire, and that copper wire has current flow through it. There is the supply. Current flow, there is the arrow. Current is going in, out, in, out through the coil, and back and forth to the supply. So they usually use a concept called right-hand grip rule. What is this right-hand grip rule? When the solenoid is to be taken in the right-hand side with the fingers pointing in the direction of the current flow. So you wrap your fingers around the iron core. Remember your fingers are indicating what? Direction of current flow. So they want to know which direction will be the magnetic flux. It's the thumb. So you need to hold the thumb along the length of the solenoid. It's like you hold the plastic bottle around, but the thumb is not wrapped. It's just straight on the bottle. The thumb will indicate the direction of mag uh, magnetic field from north to south, which is here. There is north, there is south. And this is indicating the direction of mag um, current flow in the wire. So you can hold it vertically, you can hold it horizontally, you can hold it downwards. Remember the thumb is changing direction. Whenever the thumb is pointing, that is the direction of the north side of the magnet or the solar um, iron core. 
it has got a north yes. and its north depends on where the thumb is pointing that's what they call right hand grip rule in case you you're doubting they say that is what we call then what are the three things that will strengthen magnetic field i've, I've already mentioned increasing current flow placing an iron core inside the solenoid fine like doing this you're increasing magnetic field all these are lines of magnet you see here north to south north to south north to south north to south the next part is increasing the number of turns which we mentioned increasing the number of turns or coils by keeping the current constant so you increase the number of coils you are increasing magnetic field okay then uh, yes i'm almost done yeah faraday's law here is faraday's law when a conductor cuts or be cut by a magnetic flux there is emf generated you know what is emf voltage electric magnetic flow electromotive force electro what electromotive force yes this electromotive force is the voltage that a generator produces because as long as the wire is being cut by the magnetic field or a wire is cutting through the magnetic field you can have a magnet on your right and on your left north and south then you have a wire perpendicular to the magnetic flux that wire will be introduced with emf voltage will be introduced in the wire that is how a, mag a generator works it works on induction this is a process we call induction process it is the process by which voltage is produced through a wire being cut by magnetic field so lines of magnets are called magnetic flux so it's the faraday who said that when a conductor is cut or is being cut through by magnetic flux a generated emf will be induced in the conductor so you will have voltage in the wire okay and the three types of uh, inductions that we are going to learn is dynamic induction this question once came in the exam not even once so many times 20 marks to draw this sketch here draw the sketch explain the dynamic induction okay. how do we explain dynamic dynamic means movement so what happens with this before i read there you need to have a setup a solenoid on your left you know this is a solenoid right on your left yes and then you need to have a galvanometer this g is a galvanometer or an indicator that shows which direction voltage is going positive or negative once we start producing voltage it is here just to indicate whether voltage is being induced or not then on your right hand side here you you need to have a permanent magnet this is a permanent magnet north and south with the lines of magnet flowing from north to south and then the meaning of dynamic it's movement so you need to move this permanent magnet towards the solenoid and away to and from to and from that's why it's in and out as you are moving this magnet in and out it's moving at a certain velocity in meters per second but the lines of magnet here that is being produced will end up cutting through the wire the coil you see the coil on the left the lines of magnet which are these when i move this magnet to the to the left near the solenoid these lines of magnets are growing you know they are growing they will cut through this wire which is the coil once the coil is cut by these lines of magnet there is induction taking place emf will be induced in the wire and that emf will be seen on the galvanometer it will start deflecting without you touching anything this galvanometer will start deflecting and that is what Faraday said just on top here. When a conductor cuts or be cut by a magnetic flux, EMF will be generated. But how do we prove that? It's by setting up dynamic induction. When you read through here, when a coil is wound and placed in a free air and a galvanometer, which is a sensitive center zero ammeter, is connected at the ends of this coil and the permanent magnet is moved next to the coil, the meter registers a momentary current induced. Its current and EMF will be induced into the wire. When the permanent magnet is pulled away from the coil, the momentary current flow will be in the opposite direction. So you have this deflector to the right, to the left. It depends which side the magnet is moving. 
whether forward or backwards. They are saying no current will be induced when the magnet is at rest. You leave the magnet here, you leave the solenoid here. There's not going to be induction unless these lines of magnets cut through the wire. Then induction has taken place. There's always supposed to be a change, you know, movement to cutting through, then you move away, cut through, away. Then the second uh, induction is this one, which we call static induction. Dynamic induction is a generator theorem. A generator works with movement. I think you've seen that when we go to power plants, a generator is coupled to a turbine. Why? Because a turbine produces movement into the rotor of a generator. The rotor in the generator must always be rotating where well, it's being cut by the magnetic field. It's rotating. If it's not rotating, there won't be induction. So it must always produce movement, and that is what we call dynamic induction, generator theorem, this one. Okay. When we come to static induction, it is what happens in uh, transformers. In a transformer, I don't think you've seen a transformer moving. No. Transformer is stationary. But what it is doing is it's transforming the voltage. Transformation means increasing voltage or reducing voltage, stepping up voltage or stepping down voltage. But for that to happen, you need to have two coils, one on the left, one on the right. The one on the right is the one that is producing magnetic field. Can you see the lines of magnet? Yes. And these lines of magnet, you are only going to see them when you close the switch here because current is now going to start flow, uh, flowing through the coil. So once the switch is closed, current will start flowing through the coil. And as current is flowing, it produces what we call magnetic flux. Then when the lines of magnetic flux start growing, when you increase current, this magnetic field will increase. They will be cutting through the wire on the left, which is the coil. And what happens according to Faraday, when the lines of magnet cut the wire, there's induction. And the induction will be seen on a galvanometer. It will start deflecting. There's no movement like a, a dynamic induction where we moved um, that uh, magnet to and from. This is mutual induction or static induction. When this permanent magnet is placed by, replaced by a solenoid and placed near the wound coil, the switch is closed and the magnetic flux is built up and around the solenoid. This wound coil will be inside this magnetic flux. We can see the coil is inside the flux. Okay? And the momentary current flow in one direction is induced into the coil. That will be current that will be induced, or EMF will be induced. When the switch is open again, when you open the switch, this galvanometer will go to the other side, to the opposite direction. It means that current is flowing in the opposite direction and the magnetic flux will reduce because there's no current flow, so it's going to collapse. And that indicator will go back to zero at the end. All right. This is what we call transformer theorem. So I've given you three theorems. Transformer theorem, the motor theorem, and generator theorem, dynamic induction. And that is where we can end. Fleming's right hand row here talks about generator. You can hear the generator theorem. When the thumb, index, and the middle finger on your right hand side are held at 90 degrees to each other, the index finger points in the direction of magnetic field. The thumb is always in the direction of the conductor movement. When you move the conductor, it's the same as you move the magnet. One of the two must be in motion, either the, mag the magnet the way we moved the magnet to and from, or you can leave the magnet stationed and then move the conductor to be cut by the magnetic field to and from. Okay, so the thumb here is the indicator for the direction of movement. And the middle finger is now showing the direction of induced EMF. On the le left hand theorem, if you remember Fleming's left hand, the middle finger was current. Here, the middle finger is voltage, which is EMF, electromotive force, which is the one generated. And how do we get the formula to solve? There is the equation. Voltage, or E, 
equals to density times length times velocity, not voltage. This is the speed at which the magnet is moving. For you to get the higher EMF, you need to have higher density, you need to have a long wire and or coil, and you need to have higher speed, velocity in meters per second. The other formula I gave you previously for left-hand rule, it was force, ne? you remember force is density L times I. Mm -hmm. They are different. So this for right-hand rule is for generator. The left-hand rule had current here where there is the velocity, it was replaced with current. All right, so if you know the units and the examiner might ask you to say, even in the generator, how do they calculate amount of voltage that will be produced by a generator? There is the formula. You need to know how much density in flux. There is the density, flux density in Tesla or Weber per square meters. How much density is in the generator for the flux? What is the length of the copper wire in the generator? You need to know in meters. What is the speed of the generator, the rotor itself in the generator? How fast is it moving? Being that it's coupled to a turbine, it's moving at you know, rotational speed. That is the velocity there. Yes. Okay. All right. The last statement here is talking about Lenz's law, which you said you have never heard. Lenz and Faraday, they speak of the same things, except that Lenz had to add something else here. He said, when there is a change in current flow through a coil, there will also be a change of flux around the coil. Do you understand this statement? Yes. When current alternates, that's change. When current changes, even the magnetic flux that it produces will change. You will agree? Yeah. When you increase current, there will be more magnetic field. When current reduces, less magnetic field. So it alternates. Okay? When there is a change in the flux, there will be an EMF induced in the coil. So he said that as long as there is a change in the flux, that's when there is going to be EMF produced, electromotive force. And what is going to cause that change? It's the movement. That's why we were moving that magnetic uh, magnet to and from. We are changing towards and away, negative velocity, then backwards. What we are trying to achieve is a change in magnetic field. Or either you can change the current flow increase, reduce, increase, reduce. Then you will see the flux also changing. And as the flux is changing, the EMF that will be produced will be there, but it's going to be positive, negative as well. That is what we call induction process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please have time to go through this exercise again. This exercise on page 16 is talking about, you know, inductors, and then in the generator, this is generator theory, all of it, dynamic induction. It's all about dynamic. Then I gave you page 11 on that force uh, left-hand row to calculate the force on the conductor when current is in or out of the conductor. Yeah, when I meet you next week, we'll do some calculations. I'll talk about this theory, it's eddy current, but have time to read. It's only a few things I've left here. Few, 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 few things, and then we can. Eh? Then yeah. you get to module three. <laughs> There's still. But I'll, I'll go through it. Yes. I still need There's to still talk. No, I still need to talk next week. I see the theory that I, I still have to explain this one. Yeah. Yeah. Still Just what things. after I explain next week, then we go to theory, uh, to practical drawings. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, why I'm ending now is only on page sixteen here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I want you to go through this, even now uh, Wayne and the others that will be watching the video, they must go through these calculations. If there's any challenges, you can still uh, WhatsApp me. Don't wait for next week, Tuesday. You can still talk to me to say this question, how do I tackle it, you know, like that. Yeah, all right. Okay. Um, you send us a um, um, uh, WhatsApp on our exam in roll papers. Mm -hmm. yeah. We ended in by the 23rd mm -hmm. of March. Yes. Um, for, for obviously for, for what we're going to write but um when are we getting results back from our previous exams because you know maybe if we have to write something over mm. then we have to reapply for it again you know so mm. on that one cool. i think it's it should be this week next week you know it was we were expecting results this week that's why yeah. i'm i'm not working by admin there 
I'm not too sure when. It yeah. should be this week. If not this week, it should be next week. But after we register you these ones, if there's any negatives or whatever will come out, we are going to register your names on the prelims. There's another chance they send the papers for us to do addition. Okay. Yes, that's when we can do that. All right. Okay. All right. All right, yes, I'm good. Okay, then. Keep well. See you next time. Right, okay, thank Bye. you.